All right, it is one, five minutes after one, and I am opening up this meeting. I will now call to order the February 15th, 2018, regular meeting of the City of Rancho Mirage City Council Library and Observatory Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council, representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. We will now please stand for the flag salute, and Sean, would you please do the honors Thank you, everybody. Now, will we please have the roll call, Chrissy. Council Member Hobart? Here. Council Member Smotrich? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Kite? Here. And Mayor Townsend? I am here. All right. Now we will move to presentations. First is a presentation for the citizens on patrol. Now, usually I say on parole, but I did get it right <laughs> this time. <laughs> Uh, service program will be presented by Brian Kephart, Senior Code Appliance Officer. And, uh, appliance officer. A, did I say appliance? He fixes washers. You said compliance. You washers and dryers yeah. also? Yes. See, that <laughs> appliance added, officer, yes. That and parole. We check appliances as well. You know, <laughs> I do have a pattern going here. <laughs> um, as you know, we recently added two deputies to the police force for a total of 31 sworn officers. The COPS program is yet another example of the city's proactive approach to public safety. Next is you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the city council. As you're all aware, my name is Brian Keppard. I am the staff liaison to the city of Ranch Mara's Citizens on Patrol <coughs> program. I'm here today to give a brief presentation and update on the COPS program, what it has done and what it continues to do. First, for our guests here today and those watching from home who are not familiar with the program, the COPS program is a volunteer organization composed of primarily but not exclusively Rancho Mirage residents who want to give back to their community and, and want to have some fun doing it. Our COPS patrol the city acting as an extra set of eyes and ears and as helping hands. They provide a public service by stopping and helping stranded motorists. They increase safety by assisting the police at, at the, and the city with additional traffic control at traffic collisions and special events. They improve community safety and security by patrolling our residential communities and identifying suspicious activity. They preserve and increase the property values by reporting code compliance violations to the city. They are the city's goodwill ambassadors, welcoming you to this beautiful city and all it has to offer. I would like to report on some of the key summary stats for 2017. Last year, the COPS program volunteered a total of 6,677 hours. They drove 31,491 miles and documented 279 separate incidents of helping the police, helping motorists, or reporting code compliance issues. I drew up a couple of comparisons to help visualize this information. Of the total miles driven, you could drive to New York 11 times. Of the total hours volunteered, that is equivalent to 3.2 full-time equivalent employees. At $25 an hour, that is equivalent to over $166,000 a year without benefits. With benefits, that could easily cost over $200,000 a year. You compare that to a, an annual budget of $25,000 to sustain the program and cover its operating expenditures, the city is making a smart investment in its community safety and security. In 2017, at one of the regular meetings, one of our COPS officers, Rich Ronzello, was recognized by the organization RSVP as an outstanding volunteer in eastern Riverside County. RSVP, which stands for Retired Senior Volunteer Program, and sponsored by the Riverside County Department of Aging, offers, her, offers volunteer recruitment, retention, and recognition in eastern Riverside County. Last month, 
we had our second annual Cops Appreciation Luncheon, which was held at the Springs Country Club. At that event, we announced the retirement of married duo Bob and Connie Rogers after 20 years of dedicated service in Rancho Mirage Cops and to the city of Rancho Mirage. The Cops Luncheon is a new program we put together last year to thank our cops for their continued service. I'd like to point out that despite the hours and miles that we can track, there is the un undocumented impact this program has on our community. You may not see them every day, but there are the hundreds of people who do every single day on the streets and in the communities. There is an extra element of safety and security as well as a distinct deterrent effect by having our officers patrolling around. I would like to take this moment to ask our COPS volunteers to please stand so we can give them a round of applause for their exemplary and continued service. Excellent job on, on their behalf. To wrap up my presentation, I would like to first thank the City Council for the continued support of the COPS program, as we look forward to many more years of effective community involvement. Second, we are always actively looking for new members. You just need to be 21 years of age, have a valid driver's license and a good dri satisfactory driving record, and a good background, and you can be a Ranch Mirage COP. More information is available on our website, ranchmiragecops.com, all one word, where you can download and fill out the application. And I would be happy to answer any questions the council may have. Thank you, Brian. It's a, it's a great organization, a great group, very handsome, and I'm glad you're off parole, needless <laughs> to say. <laughs> and also, they have two brand new automobiles that they are tooling around. That is correct. Uh, we did uh, make a couple uh, capital purchases last year. We got two brand new vehicles. I wish I had pictures of them with me just now, but we did uh, uh, introduce those into the fleet and they've been a, tr a tremendous addition. Uh, they're reliable, they're beautiful, they're well equipped, they're safe, and uh, they're, 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 they enjoy them. And I enjoy them and I'm sure the residents enjoy seeing them. Uh, driving up and down their neighborhood. Well, they look very good in those vehicles. I they will sure say do. that I'm very impressed with it all. Do we have any council comments from anybody that would like to say anything? With that, thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, whole group. Thank you all for coming down here and being with us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right, up next is an update on the Bighorn Institute. Mayor Pro Tem has requested the honor of introducing our next presenter. However, however, this city, I, if I may add, support of the Bighorn Institute has been strong and unwavering for many years. Behind me, the symbolism of the Bighorn is part of our city logo. And we must never forget that before we were here, Bighorn roamed the mountains and they were here kind of first. It is incumbent upon us that we do everything we can to support this endangered species. And that means supporting the Bighorn Institute. So with that, Richard, please introduce to the presenters. Well, Mr. Mayor, I don't have much else to say. You did such a great you did, job. I, did do it well. I would like to uh, introduce though the associate director and biologist of the Bighorn Institute, Amy Bayard. Amy, it's good to have you here today. Uh, as Charlie said, we've had a long-standing relationship with the Bighorn Institute that goes back some 15 years when we were involved in raising over a million dollars to put up the four miles of fence to protect the Bighorn from getting killed on the highway falling into pools, eating uh, pesticides. So we really uh, support the Bighorn Institute. They've done a great job. And Amy, you've been there about 18 years, I think? 17. 17 years, so you've done a great job. You've seen it you. grow. The population of the herd has not only grown in the Palm Springs area, but also in our area. So it's great to have you here today. And if you'll just bring us up to date on the Big Horn and how they're doing. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem and Mr. Mayor and council members for the opportunity to be here today to give you an update about the sheep here 
in your uh, Rancho Mirage Mountains. So, the, this? Yeah, Is that you better? Go. There you go. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so the herd in the Rancho Mirage Mountains are referred to as the Northern Santa Rosa Mountains herd. There are currently 76 adult bighorn in this herd, which is really good. There's 36 adult females and 40 males. Uh, the bad news is we only had two lambs survive last year for 2017, so really poor lamb survival, unfortunately. But the good news is we had a very unique incident happen with we had uh, two lambing seasons last year. That never happens with bighorn sheep. We've documented it one other year in our 36-year history in your herd, the Northern Santa Rosa Mountains, back in 2005. So we had nine fall lambs born this past year. Most of those are still alive, and uh, the ewes gave birth twice in one year, which, like I said, is unheard of. Some exciting new news for this year is it's lambing season right now, so we have 13 new babies running around the mountains behind City Hall here, and uh, so that's encouraging for the, the coming year. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife radio collared 10 adult females in November, so we now have 17 adult ewes to track in the local mountains behind Rancho Mirage. Unfortunately, one of those collars has become um, kind of non-functional as far as it's stuck on mortality mode. All of these radio collars have a mortality beacon, so they have a sensor if a sheep lies still for four hours or more, that the collar beat will double, and we know that that animal is potentially dead. We need to check it out. This animal is alive, which is great, but unfortunately, because that collar is now beating at a double beat, it's probably going to drain the battery life much faster. We can usually get about five to seven years from a collar on each animal. This animal, I don't know, probably lasts you know, a couple years less at least. We had just one adult ewe mortality that we uh, recorded in 2017. This ewe died from dystocia, which is complications with giving birth. We did a necropsy on her and actually found a full-term male lamb. So it would have been her first lamb. So it's just sometimes these things happen um, where you know, often you don't get to document it because so many of the animals are uncollared. Um, but we, this population saw about a 20% decrease, which isn't necessarily alarming because as a large mammal, populations kind of are cyclical. You go up and then you come down and that's just the way it is. And it's still a healthy population. We're very pleased with the numbers right now. And I can't, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the Ranch and Mirage fence that uh, Mayor Pro Tem Kite mentioned. It's now been up for 15 full years. This fence has been an incredible recovery tool for this herd. It completely eliminated all urban related deaths and has pushed those sheep back into their na native habitat. And without that, we would have all of the deaths that uh, Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, and uh, the, health, the herd was much less healthy at that time. The city provides water for the sheep in uh, your sheep preserve. Um, Britt Wilson is actually instrumental. He works with us on helping us maintain this water source and ensuring that there's water for the sheep. Um, we hike into it throughout the year and make sure that it's functioning and then it's um, clear vegetation. On the left you see that's the catchment full of vegetation. On the right you see where we've cleared it out. Um, but the sheep rely on this, especially during the summertime. So this is a very important water source for these sheep where they don't have year-round natural water in the northern Santa Rosa Mountains. Besides monitoring the sheep, we're out in the community trying to educate um, the community and get them involved in the sheep and the conservation work we do. We have a Bighorn Institute project on iNaturalist where hikers can log their sheep sightings, which is great for us because it helps us keep track of the herds, most of which are unmarked. But it's also good for hikers because then they can go on the project and see where there's Bighorn sheep locations recently and try to see them. We have monthly member hikes, and a lot of Ranch and Mirage members actually participate in those, and we've had great luck going out each month on some of our local trails and looking for the sheep. And we give numerous presentations throughout the year, often to Ranch and Mirage interest groups. And we just um, had a, two new high school interns from La Quinta High School join us. They have a veterinary pathway there, but if Ranch and Mirage High School has any sort of um, internship program that might uh, be conducive to partnering with Bighorn Institute, we would certainly love that. We're going to be giving a very in-depth Bighorn Sheep talk at the Ranch Mirage Library on April 10th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you want to hear more about the Coachella Valley population of Bighorn and our work, you're, we would welcome you to join us then. 
And our future work includes maybe bringing in some sick lambs. I'm sure you've seen in the news, La Quinta has a lot of sick sheep because they have the urban issues that Rancher Mirage had years ago and apparently haven't learned. Rancher Mirage did a wonderful thing with the fence and it's helped the herd, so we, we're gonna see about doing that. We're going to um, keep maintaining our captive herd because we don't know if we'll have to be releasing more sheep into the wild. We're gonna keep monitoring the sheep from Palm Springs to La Quinta. We have about 50 radio collar sheep that we monitor. And we'll have our 2018 annual party in golf classic. That's our primary fundraiser that the city so generously uh, partnered with us on, sponsored. Uh, we hope that you will join us for that in the coming year. Mostly we just wanna thank you for your most generous support. Um, we couldn't do what we did without the city's support and we just appreciate you so much. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Richard. Yes, sir. Any comments? Well, they're doing a great job, and you can just tell by the amount of the herd increasing over the last few years. So we're learning more about the bighorn and how to preserve them better, and uh, it's really important to the city of Rancho Mirage to keep our bighorn yeah. above <clears throat> us and, and remember you know, how much they mean to us. So. Yeah. And Richard, you were really there at the beginning of this, weren't you? Pardon me? Pretty much at the beginning of this. Well, almost at the beginning. Yeah. I think the bighorn sheep got here before I did. But, uh, yeah. but we've, been, uh, we've been working with them, and uh, certainly the staff up at the Bighorn Institute is doing a great job now working with the city of La Quinta to try and get a fence up in La Quinta to protect all the sheep there. Yes. So Amy's the real local expert, though. She does a great job. Thank you very Amy, much. Amy, I'm glad you didn't show... <clears throat> the picture that you did last uh, week when Richard and I were there. Amy showed a picture uh, of the mountains and there were a number of sheep in the picture. And she uh, asked, now, there's five sheep in the picture. How many of you can pick out all five? Now, if anyone in that audience picked out all five, they weren't really telling the truth. It was virtually impossible. And how these sheep are just <clears throat> just blend into the environment is incredible. You might mention one other thing. I was always curious as to how you got the collars on the sheep, how you were able to <clears throat> track them. You might describe what you do from a helicopter standpoint. Sure. So these sheep are captured with a helicopter using a net gun fired from the helicopter. We don't use drugs. That's been proven to be too dangerous. Um, it's a very quick process. You can pursue an animal for five minutes. If you don't catch it within five minutes, you're done because it's an endangered species. But you catch them in a net, you have a capture crew that lands the helicopter and restrains that animal and they usually fly them into a base camp where there's a number of us waiting to process that animal. You get them out, you take a number of blood samples and other health tests for them. There's usually a veterinarian in the base camp. To examine that animal, you'll do an ultrasound and uh, check for pregnancy, different things like that. They have an ear tag, at least one, maybe two ear tags placed in their ears and a designated radio collar put on their necks and uh, then they're released into the wild. And then we have uh, telemetry equipment, equipment. We go around every day in the field and we listen for that radio collar signal. They can't hear it. it there's no outward signs. If you were standing near the sheep, you wouldn't hear anything. Um, but it's different radio stations basically that we tune in and listen. So yeah, it's a, it's a stressful project. You know, when you have to capture, you do it every other year. It's very stressful, but it's like going to the dentist, how we describe, you know, it's for the well-being. You have to do it. It's very short time um, and, it, and the dividends are, are unparalleled. Thanks, Amy. Fascinating Thank process. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Surely. you. Appreciate sure. it. Just one second. Oh, Dana. Uh, Amy, um, looking at that fence reminded me of those days when the fence was uh, being contemplated and funding. Tom Martin and his wife, as you know, uh, played a gigantic role yes. uh, in that uh, funding. And I'm just wondering whether you're still in contact with, uh, with either or both of them. We've been in contact with the Martins over the years. They moved to LA full time, um, but you know, they paid to have a drinker put in on their, behind their property and the BLM is in charge of that now, but they still pay that water bill really? all the time. They're yeah, very good people. And uh, yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Amy, you. Oh, thanks, Amy. Yeah. Just one Thank more you. Co uh, question. If you could possibly list your um, a contact number where people can get in touch with you if they want to attend some of your events. I know you had a beautiful event we attended last year, yes. and you've got some wonderful uh, support group. And if people do want to get in touch with you, how would they go about it? 
Thank you for asking. Um, you can always contact us on our website, bighorninstitute.org, and our phone number is 760-346-7334. Thank you very much. 760-346-7334. Thank you. Thank you Good very job. Much. Congratulations, you really. <clears throat> Before we uh, move on to public comments, I'd like to turn this over to Randy Binder, who has something to share with us. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, introduce you all to our new Public Works Director, Jesse Eckenroth. He's been in Public Works now for a couple of years. He started in the um, Finance Department under Isaiah Hagerman. Um, he's got a lot of private sector experience, contractor licenses, and um, is great at budgeting and timing. and. Public Works Department is the largest department in City Hall with the Streets Division, Landscape Maintenance Division, Civil Engineering Division, and um, the entire city staff is behind you, and I'm happy to make that promotion to you. And I guess, Jesse, your wife, Shannon, showed up today uh, by surprise with two of your children, what, Davin and Caden? Uh-huh. All right, where, the, are, where are you guys? Yeah. Stand up. Let's see. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'm sure you're very proud of your husband, and so are we. Congratulations. Thank you. I look forward to the opportunity. Good boy. Thank you, buddy. All right. Now we will move on to the non-agenda public comments. And this is the opportunity for you to speak on issues that are not on the agenda. Give your name, where you live, and three minutes, please. And the first person I'm going to call on is Alan Worthy. Alan. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And uh, the first thing I want to say uh, is thank all of you again for your unwavering support and standing on your principle and ethics are sadly missing in our society and entities that we rely on. Uh, and because you have done so, and I know the three of you, you have an election around the corner, well, I'd like to say that I support you. I no longer live here, but uh, obviously I had this horrible incident here, and that's what you've given me all of this support for. Uh, I can't think of any three people that deserve to be reelected more than the three of you. And I'll stand behind you and have with the CV link and your rejection of it, which I support that as well. So uh, all the best to the three of you and all of you. And thank you so much. Uh, I did leave a copy of this letter that uh, the third party attorney for Eisenhower asked me to prepare and I had my associate producer prepare it. It was emailed to them. The phone appointment was yesterday. And I'm sorry to say that the conversation devolved as usual, which is why I have given you a copy of it. Uh, but you, should, you deserve to have it at this point anyway. They have created such a conundrum that is so difficult to get out of. I guess if I wanted to make light of it, as my mother said, it would take a Philadelphia lawyer to sort it out at this point. <laughs> you know, it is absolutely despicable. It is a disgrace. And again, I am calling on all of them at the top to resign. Celine Kaiser, the director of risk management, is inept. She is unprofessional. She's been nothing but rude and nasty to me. In the letter, it again recounts the fact that they have cheated me out of my uh, settlement from Nationwide. You know, you can only wonder in this day and age, and it just ties into everything we're going through, whether it's Washington or this horror yesterday in Florida, people are not listening, they're not awake, they're not paying attention to what is going on around them, even when it's obvious and right in front of them. Like this idiot yesterday. Well, is he an idiot or is he mentally ill? But he was known. Okay, this situation has been known to them. It's called moral turpitude, and in the church it's called moral idiocy. And they've allowed it to go on and on and on. 
So again, I thank you for your support. It has to come to a stop over there. It is illegal, it is a crime scene, and it has to stop. And Opry Zerfling, should President CEO, for those of you who don't know for some reason, is aware of it, he should be ashamed of himself, he should resign, as well as Celine Kaiser and Michael Appelhans. Get out. Thank you. All right, Helen. Next on the agenda is Mr. Bill Priest. <clears throat> Name where you reside? Yes, I'm Bill, I'm Bill Priest. I reside on Colgate Drive uh, in the Springs Country Club. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Myself, I, I'm here along with uh, two other members of the uh, committee at the Springs who's, who are responsible for the public safety, uh, traffic control, and those kinds of things at the Springs Country Club. We've had an ongoing lengthy concern about the traffic and the speed on uh, Morningside Drive, which is adjacent to us and runs between uh, the Springs and Morningside. The speed limit there is 50 miles an hour. There, it's a racetrack all the way from Frank Sinatra to uh, Country Club. Uh, and we're very concerned that there's going to be a really bad accident right at that juncture on where our back gate is on Morningside, directly across the street from the entrance to the Morningside Country Club. We need a four-way stop at that intersection uh, because I've seen and our patrol people have seen many instances of near accidents. <coughs> people can't see very well uh, in that location. There's a lot of shrubbery and uh, foliage that kind of blocks your vision. So we have asked the city to put in a four-way stop sign at that. And in addition, I really think that we ought to consider reducing the speed limit from 50 miles an hour. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, two of my <laughs> fellow members. Yeah. <clears throat> three? Do we have three? three. Okay. Uh, Peter Samuels. I think many of you know Peter. Uh, oh, Mark Handler, who is also on our committee. And Donna Maloof. Uh, I think many of you probably know these folks. Donna uh, Maloof. Yes, I do. <laughs> she speaks highly of you, by the way. Yes, yes. <laughs> and we worked together for 25 years right. at the LA Times, so I that heard, gives us a I little heard, background. I heard the stories. Yes. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, why we're here. We'd like to urge you to consider this because we think it's a major public safety issue, and we are very concerned that we're going to have a fatality over there one of these days. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bill. Let me turn this over to Randy Binder. Yeah, Randy, do you have any comments? Yeah, sure, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Bill. How are you? Hi. Uh, Jesse Eckenroth, our new Public Works Director, who you just met a few minutes ago, uh, he and I will get together and talk with our um, Traffic Safety Commission, and I'm sure we'll come to some solution that's satisfactory to both the Springs and Morningside. Thank you. Thank very you very good. much. Any other questions you have? Is that it? Very good. Thank we're you. On, we're on it. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Mr. Peter Samuels. Mr. Mayor, council members and staff, my name is Peter Albert Samuels. I am currently on the board of the HOA at the Springs and I'm the chairman of the Community Service Committee which is responsible for security inside and outside of the property. Bill eloquently, as only a lawyer can, presented our case. Um, I have done uh, most of the legwork that some of you have asked me to do, and there is no reason on this earth why stop signs can't be placed on both sides of the street. None. Uh, just to give you a little bit, I'm not angry, but just to tell you so that, Jesse, you now know, uh, two years ago, I left a letter with the appropriate department complaining about this. And since then, we've had probably a half a dozen people, golf carts get hit, cars get hit, 
um, has never been really reported as a major incident, but I think it's appropriate that you understand that it has gone on. There are 50 members plus who live in Morningside and commute across the street to use the Springs property. I would hate to have one of them hurt. So please put your good hearts to work and help us so that we don't have an accident. Thanks so much and thanks for thinking and use it, thanks for allowing us to present our, our uh, case to you. Thank All the you. best. And one other yes. thing, one other thing. I'll take an extra minute. Um, I want to wish the three candidates who are running for office uh, the, be the best of luck. You have our support, and we look forward to seeing you Sunday um, at the Springs Annual Meeting. You're always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much. Appreciate that. Next on the agenda is Jill Aviet. Did I say that right, Jill? <laughs> Help me. I'm Jill Oviat, and go. I'm the public information manager for the Coachella Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District. And I am here today to um, just remind everybody that the Fight the Bite 5K is going to be in Rancho Mirage this year on March 24th at the um, Community Center Park and uh, the Rancho Mirage Community <clears throat> Park. And um, I want to invite all of you here and uh, hope that you come and bring your family and friends and try to promote it as much as possible. Um, as you're I'm sure you're well aware, uh, we do have mosquito threats in the desert. Oftentimes people don't think we have mosquitoes in the de desert, and we do. We have West Nile virus in humans most years since 2003 um, that comes from being bitten by an infected mosquito. And in the last uh, couple of years, we have a new invasive mosquito called the Aedes aegypti, which is surrounding Rancho Mirage right now. It's in Palm Desert, it's in Indian Wells, it's in La Quinta, and it's, it might be here and we just haven't detected it yet, but it will be here soon. And um, this is the kind of mosquito that can transmit diseases like Zika virus, um, dengue virus, chikungunya, viruses we don't want here. And so at this fun run, you can come and learn all about this and learn how to get rid of those sources where those mosquitoes breed and keep our population safe. And I have for each and every one of you one of the things we're going to be giving away um, at the run, which is a dump it, drain it, scrub it clean, make <laughs> mosquito prevention your weekly routine. Just dip this little flat thing in water and whew, it becomes a sponge. And you can then scrub things to get those um, eggs out of containers that may be uh, breeding mosquitoes. Now, where okay. do they get those, Jill? These here, yeah. uh, when you sign up for the run, it's actually $20. You get a t-shirt, one of these things, and a few other fun gifts just for $20. If you sign up before February 24th, after that, the price goes up to $30 and then $35 on race day. But even at $35, it's a great deal. We're not raising any money. We're basically spending money, but also just recouping some of the costs. And this will be in each one of the race bags. Very good. I love your enthusiasm, Jill. You, you <laughs> do it well. I hate mosquitoes. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Jill, can okay, you just thank tell you. us a little bit about where people can sign up ahead of time and yes, so they if, might contact? Yes, thank you very much. You're like the, the reminder person for yeah. the <laughs> contact information. If you go to C cvmvcd.org. Um, that's the website that will get you to the race link to register. For people who can't remember all of the different uh, letters, you can go to cvmosquito.org, and that will also take you to our website. And cvmosquito.org. Correct. And you can also call 760-342-8287, and we'll be happy to give you any more information on that. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks for the support of Rancho Mirage in putting on this race. Dana. Excuse me, can I ask her a question? Yes, you may. Um, as a former member of the Vector Control District, um, would you tell our residents uh, just exactly what you people do and how to go about getting it with respect to killing off red imported fire ants that uh, oh, yeah. uh, were our pandemic uh, at least in season. Yes, yeah, so um, red imported fire ants are a problem all year long, as you were mentioning, and so people can just call the district and ask for the um, 
the, the call center, it's pressing one, and that will take you to the call center, and you can report fire ants there, and we'll set up a treatment for you. But don't forget about the mosquitoes. That's why I'm here today. <laughs> is, is it still, still water that uh, is the biggest enemy of man with, with respect to mosquitoes, these mosquitoes? Uh, mos absolutely. So standing water in the desert, we really wouldn't have mosquitoes in the desert if we weren't here, if people weren't here. And that's one of the great things about where we live is that we have total control over getting rid of and controlling that standing water. We could basically get rid of West Nile virus and other potential tropical diseases coming here if we dumped and drained all of the water in our yard. Very good. Jill, do you still give out the program where you give out the little uh, mosquito fish? We do, yes. Do you want uh, so to talk about that a minute? We uh, so mosquito fish um, are our biological way of getting rid of mosquitoes. If you can't get rid of your standing water for some reason, it's a decorative pond you had that, that doesn't have filtration, mosquito fish can live in there and they're top feeders and they eat the larvae right off the top of the, um, the water, the surface of the water, and you can get those for free at the district. Very good, thank you. Any other questions of Jill? Okay, thank you. Wonderful job. Well, thank you very much again. Thanks, Jill. <clears throat> Next, we're going to have Jeffrey Norman. Jeffrey from our wonderful Ranch Mirage Chamber of Commerce. Hi, Jeff. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Jeffrey sir. Norman. I live uh, <coughs> on Cedar Lake Court in Ranch Mirage. I'm Director of Communications and Public Affairs for the McCallum Theater and a member of the board of the Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce. And I'm delighted to represent the chamber today before this august body. Just a few things we'd like to tell you about. Um, tomorrow morning at 1130, uh, we will have a ribbon cutting for Club Pilates which is located in the Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center. And they're gonna be celebrating all weekend long and they're looking forward to meeting everyone. Our February mixer is going to be this Thursday, uh, this Tuesday rather, uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. at Homewood Suites by Hilton in Palm Desert. And of course, we're looking forward to hosting the candidate forum uh, for the Rancho Mirage City Council one week from today on February 22nd uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Rancho Mirage Public Library and Observatory. And we thank all of you for agreeing to participate and it should be a very informative evening. February 23rd at 5.30, we will be having a ribbon cutting for Craft Bar and Grill at the S, which is, of course, formerly Desert Island. And that should be a fun evening as they're also hosting their grand opening that night. Uh, our business over breakfast is growing each time, and our topic this month is something that we all need to learn about, uh, which is life-work balance. Uh, it's going to be held on February 28th from 7.30 to 9 a.m. at uh, Aqua California Bistro at the river. And these workshops are open to everyone. We just ask that you RSVP to the chamber office. Finally, on March 1st at 4.30, we will be having a ribbon cutting for drink at the river. And they're excited to show off their new concept to the community. So we invite you to join us for uh, that as well. And on behalf of my fellow chamber members, uh, first of all, thank you again for uh, making our uh, Rammy Award such a great success this year. Uh, and we thank you for your continued support and uh, not only of the chamber, but the entire business community. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Wonderful job as always. You guys are doing great. <clears throat> all right, anybody else in the audience who did not fill out a card who wishes to speak, now's your time. Okay, I see none. So with that, I'll close that portion and I will move on to council comments. With <laughs> that, I will start. We're gonna start with Music in the Park, the series. However, there's been a slight change and I will tell you what that's going to do. To, the, to an emergency that happened in the Cherry Poppin' Daddy's Band that was supposed to start on February the 18th. They will not be performing this Sunday. Therefore, the third annual City of Rancho Mirage Music in the Park series will kick off at the beautiful Rancho Mirage Amphitheater on February the 24th with pianist and vocalist Diana Shore. And again, if anybody hasn't seen her, she is fantastic. These are free 
programs, six magnificent programs that will be running through to March 25th. I urge you all to please try to attend. The series will showcase a variety of musical genres over the next six consecutive weekends, as I have said. These concerts are free to the public. The gates open at 5 p.m. The performances start at 7. Parking is free, and food and beverages will be available for purchases there. So be sure to pick up the 2018 Music in the Park series. These flyers are available at City Lobby or by visiting www.renshomirage.com, no, dot gov, dot gov. So there's the program with that. And I hope to see you all at the amphitheater on Saturday, February the 24th. That is five o'clock to seven o'clock. They begin at seven o'clock. Did I say that right? Gates open at five. Gates open at five, performances are seven. And the reason they open at five is it seats a thousand people. And it's usually you know, uh, sold out with a lot of people there. So we urge you at five o'clock to try to, to get there and get a good seat and good parking. So that answers that. Now, continuing now with council comments, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Mayor Pro Tem Kite. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, as you can tell from the announcement that the mayor just made, we've got a lot planned at the park over the next few weeks. And I just want to remind you that on Saturday, even though you can't go there on Sunday now, on Saturday, February 17th, from 12 noon to 4 p.m., the inaugural Rancho Mirage Wine and Food Festival will be held at the beautiful <coughs> Rancho Mirage uh, Community Park. How's that sound, Mayor? That sounds pretty good to me, boy. Food and wine. Food Does that sound and good? Wine. Over 40 wineries from California, Oregon, and Washington will be pouring their finest selections. And over 15 Rancho Mirage restaurants and eateries will provide bits of food. And the ones that are going to be there are Fleming's Steakhouse, Catalan Metropolitan or Mediterranean Restaurant. Hans of Polk, Norma's Italian Kitchen, Aqua California Bistro, Roy's, Wally's, and many more. So you're just gonna have to not eat for a couple of days beforehand and get ready for this on Saturday. So don't miss the event. This is gonna be kicking off our big season at the, at the uh, park. For tickets and more information about participating wineries, and restaurants, go to www.rmwineandfood.com. And remember, that's this Saturday from noon to four at the Rancho Mirage Community Park. Should be a great event. This will be the best one in the valley from the standpoint of being wine-centric. So it should be fun for everybody. And uh, then after this weekend, we just have events coming up every week after that. So keep your calendar handy and uh, enjoy Rancho Mirage over the next few months. Thank you, Richard. Also, please go to the, uh, the website of Rancho Mirage City Hall and you'll see all the things that are available to you. Uh, before I continue on with uh, the next council comment, I received a letter this morning here and I just wanna read it to you. It says, Dear Mayor Townsend, I took a friend from out of state to the Ranch Mirage Fire Department because she was not feeling well. There are no words to describe how wonderful the two firemen, George and Jeremiah, were. They demonstrated great professionalism, kindness, and caring. We were both so grateful and appreciative of the excellent Ranch Mirage Fire Department. Sincerely, Barbara Feldman. And I want to say, Barbara, if you're out there listening, Thank you very much for sending this in. It's always nice to hear wonderful things about not only our fire department, our police department, our city staff, and of course your city council. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Dana. To me. It is now you. Uh, I uh, would like to ask uh, Isaiah to comment on the synchronization article that appeared in today's uh, Desert uh, Sun. 
Absolutely. Uh, Jason, can we uh, pull up the files? So the, uh, the, the Desert Sun recently um, wrote an article on uh, Rancho Mirage's position when it comes to a uh, synchronization project uh, that is actually much more than that, but uh, that is being led by the Coachella Valley Association of Governments, CVAG. Uh, within this article, there is a CVAG staff member uh, that um, takes it as an opportunity to uh, really slander the city of Rancho Mirage and uh, provide some very inaccurate information when it comes to Rancho Mirage. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide some factual analysis <laughs> to uh, accompany what was in uh, this article and the statements ba made by that staff member. <clears throat> so I have a copy of it on your screen. It's a $75 million project that C CVAG wants to do. And uh, the main headline is obviously synchronizing traffic signals, which is something that is very important to the city of Rancho Mirage. Uh, it is a project that should be done. However, uh, like any project, uh, there are elements of it that were just unacceptable to our city, uh, which were not covered by this article, nor were they covered by the statements uh, made by uh, the CVAG staff members. So uh, in order to provide a complete and accurate picture of what the city's stance is and, and, and why we took this position when it comes to this project, I'd like to explain it to everybody now. So here's the article, uh, and there's really two, uh, two areas uh, that kind of sum up the gist of the article, but uh, the first statement is the CVAG staff member said, uh, Rancho Mirage's signals won't fully be coordinated with the rest of the valley. Traffic flow will be disrupted, and drivers can expect longer wait times. Uh, the other area of the article that was concerning to us was the CVAG staff member said, this isn't the first time that Rancho Mirage has opted out of the CVAG project. She said Rancho Mirage began lessening their interest in regional cooperation in the spring of 2015 when the Rancho Mirage City Council first met in a special closed session to discuss suing CVAG over CV Link. Following that meeting, the relationship continued to falter. Rancho Mirage slashed the amount of funding they historically provided to CVAG-led homelessness programs. They chose to partner with a city in Los Angeles County rather than their own neighbors on community choice aggregation. And they have dismissed CVAG's repeated offers to find compromise on regional transportation projects. So, the city of Rancho Mirage maintains our streets and traffic signals to the highest standards, which is evidenced by any person driving through our community. CVAG's plan was about total control, not traffic signal synchronization. Adoption of CVAG's plan would have surrendered the city's control over all aspects of our traffic signals to CVAG. The loss of local control of our traffic flow and signals is not in our community's best interest. The city of Rancho Mir Mirage maintains a high level of responsiveness to our community and delegating authority over to CVAG, whose committees meet seven months out of the year, is unacceptable. CVAG's plan also included millions of dollars in penalties that could be levied against Rancho Mirage for not obeying the will of a handful of outside politicians. Rancho Mirage's non-participation will have no impact to traffic flow, and traffic will continue to flow smoothly through Rancho Mirage as it currently does today. There was also another component of this project uh, that was extremely concerning, and that came to the technology end and really um, the, the price of that technology that cities would be expected to put on our traffic signals and then maintain it. So anyone can give you a piece of equipment or a building or a facility. The question is, can you operate and maintain that after they give it to you? And when you think about our streets in general, uh, what do the experts say about the availability uh, and the status of our streets? 
So the availability of funding and status of our streets. So there was an interesting article in the Press Enterprise that actually uh, was uh, co-headed by uh, the late supervisor John Benoit, and it really highlighted the condition of uh, roads within Riverside County. And I'm just going to read a, a small uh, piece of this article because it kind of demonstrates the state of our roads. Uh, our county and state are growing. Our Funding system is outdated and our infrastructure is falling into more disrepair every year. Roads in the Riverside San Bernardino metropolitan area are now ranked 14th worst among the nation's largest urban areas. Inland drivers incur $812 in additional annual car maintenance costs and even more in some areas because of our decaying roadways. The Riverside County Transportation Committee uh, Commission, RCTC, uh, released an assessment of the county's roads in January of 2016. And when it came to funding, uh, this is what their study concluded. Um, the availability of capital funding in relation to the projected $23 billion need of the infrastructure existing programs, which is category A in a chart, can cover only 26% of the need. And plausible discretionary grant funds, so meaning when we have to compete in a competitive process to get state or federal dollars, can only cover an estimated another 6% of this funding. So the total funding gap is 16 billion out of 23 billion. So RCTC is saying there's not enough money for our streets and roads. Our streets and roads are decaying. We've got a $16 billion gap even with the addition of SB1, which was the recent gas tax increase that we are all paying now, they're saying they still don't have a money, enough money, which is why RCTC would like to do another countywide sales tax measure, whereby they would ask the voters to increase the sales tax countywide, almost like another version of Measure A, because they don't have enough money. <coughs> So this technology, and it was summarized in a CVAG staff report as smart city initiative, is geared towards autonomous vehicles and anticipates smartphone <coughs> traffic apps as the technology is implemented. So as we implement um, technology to on our traffic signals that is very expensive and we will have to replace and update and maintain as the technology involves, this technology isn't even in use in our community today. So it's a $75 million project uh, that is nothing more than just someone's desire for another legacy project. All this, while many Coachella Valley cities are challenged to keep up with basic road repairs, and yet they would add this to their limited funding. <clears throat> so when this expensive technology needs to be updated or replaced, that has to come from the city's limited funding for our streets and roads. And I think uh, there was a, a quote that I'm going to show from the CVAG staff report uh, that demonstrates this uh, the best. So this is, uh, was a staff report on February 5th to the Transportation Committee at CVAG. Uh, so the staff report says, this program is not only about signal synchronization. It also establishes regional communication platform for future smart city initiatives and supports connected and autonomous vehicles. <clears throat> the program anticipates smart phone traffic apps as the technology is implemented. Later in the staff re report, they're talking about this program, <clears throat> and it's, here's the quote. Because of this innovative approach, this is a nationally preeminent project. The benefits realized for our Valley's residents and visitors through this program will become a benchmark for regional governments across the country. So here we are, again, uh, another CVAG project, uh, 
you know, where everyone in the transportation industry says, we don't have enough money for our streets and roads, yet we continue to see these projects out of our regional government with the $100 million CV link, with the $75 million traffic signal synchronization project that is not a traffic signal synchronization project. It is another one of these legacy projects that is nothing more than a naming opportunity. So going back to the article, which none of this, of course, is mentioned, the CVAC staff member, uh, you know, they've tried to portray that Rancher Mirage is poor regional partners, uh, and they use our community choice aggregation program as the example. Uh, CVAG is also doing a community choice aggregation program. Ours is called the Rancher Mirage Energy Authority. So the Rancher, Mirage, uh, Rancher Mirage's community choice aggregation program, the Rancher Mirage Energy Authority, is actually the perfect example of why we choose not to participate with some of CVAG's programs. RMEA is a standalone program governed by the Rancher Mirage City Council. RMEA has been tailored for our community and is set to launch May 1st, 2018. <clears throat> RMEA will save our community 5% on its electrical usage, which community-wide is estimated at 1.4 million after the first year of operations. While the CVAG Community Choice Aggregation Program is delayed and isn't saving anyone a single dollar, there isn't a conspiracy between CVAG and Rancho Mirage. Rancho Mirage goes through a thoughtful, analysis when analyzing projects or participation in projects. When Rancho Mirage can deliver a better program or result for our community, we do it ourselves. It's that simple. I find it odd that CVAG continually attacks Rancho Mirage, a CVAG member, for making decisions that are in the best interest of our residents and community. The city of Rancho Mirage has committed to traffic signal synchronization working with our neighbors on the timing of our signals for the betterment of the valley's transportation. However, due to the numerous reasons mentioned, we see no benefit in surrendering our local control over to CVAC. Thank you. Uh, if I may uh, continue just a little bit, Mr. Uh, yes, Mayor. sir. Um, the statement that I made on behalf of the city of Rancho Mirage on, the, on June 5th, 2017, was the following. Having a good synchronization for the valley is an ideal project. We don't oppose that in any way, shape, or form. We just want to make sure that if we are going to lose control of something or possession of something, we want to know in advance so that we can say no to that. Uh, let me ask Randy, uh, uh, about how much money have we spent on our signalization, uh, uh, synchronization programs over the years? I believe it's been about $800,000. As most everybody knows, we have pretty, a pretty fast trip down Highway 111 once we get to, um, get to uh, Bob Hope Drive and head down to um, Frank Sinatra. Uh, we have good speed there. There's uh, many times uh, most of us have made it all the way without stopping. Sometimes we get stopped because there are people coming in from some of the residential communities along the side that trip their signals. But when that doesn't happen, we've got uh, super signalization. Uh, the thing that I don't understand, well, I do understand it. It's deeper than what I want to get into. but. Uh, one of the irritants of uh, the kind of article that appeared today in the newspaper blasting Rancho Mirage because we weren't going to be part of the synchronization program is there is a contract that the cities have been offered to sign to join into the uh, regional traffic signal synchronization program. And uh, on page four of that contract, uh, here is a statement having to do with withdrawal of participation of an agency from the program. In other words, 
You're a member of the program. You now decide you want to withdraw. It says, any participating agency shall be entitled to withdraw completely from further participation in the program with at least 60 days written notice, subject to repayment or refund of any program funds spent on any fixed assets within the participating agencies, that's the city, uh, within the participating agencies' respective jurisdictional boundaries, less accumulated uh, depreciation. So the contract sets up a situation where you can be part of the synchronization program, but if you don't like it for any reason or no reason, you're allowed to withdraw from it. So why do they give us, uh, us a ration when we say we don't want to be a part of it to begin with, but we do want to cooperate in every possible way. We believe in the idea and the concept of synchronization. From La Quinta or Coachella all the way to uh, Palm Springs, if we can do anything to facilitate that, we're there to do it. But we don't want to give up control of our synchronization program to which we've spent an awful lot of money uh, over the years, and which works fine. We have a great system. People don't have trouble getting about in Rancho Mirage on any of the streets, none. Uh, and least of all, or in many respects, is Highway 111. It's a very uh, good, good part of the highway. We have the best part of Highway 111 than almost anybody, although you could make an argument, I suspect, for Indian Wells, but they don't have anything on there except grass to the sides. Uh, and, I love, and I love Indian Wells. No offense, gentlemen and lady. Uh, so the bottom line here is this whole article is a political move by CVAG to try to make us look bad because we don't want to start a program that, we have been, that would be different from what we have been working on and creating for the last several, many years, uh, probably a decade or so. Randy, how long have we been putting together our synchronization program? <laughs> well, the synchronization program started when we started putting traffic signals in. From but the, the technology to synchronize them <clears throat> is at least <clears throat> 10 years old, I would say. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but, but the whole point of local control, I don't know if you're done with your thought on yeah, this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, my observation over the years is that the city government is the one that is held most accountable um, no pun intended, it's where the rubber hits the road. Larger governmental bodies are more insulated. Uh, their employees are less accountable, I think, to the residents and the taxpayers and the people that they serve. And um, our residents count on the city to implement the circulation element in our general plan. We've kept, kept densities low. We've limited the number of signals. We've limited the number of curb cuts, which preserves the capacity of the roadways. We've planned our roads wide for peak season population, which is why it's so nice to drive around in the summertime uh, for the people that live here and work here full time. And, um, and we've implemented the general plan and we've stuck by it. And I think that um, the comments in, in the article, and I can understand the emotion of, of both of you because I feel the same way, it's a cheap shot for CVAG to say, cities, you guys haven't done a good job. Turn your streets over to us. You know what? We have done a good job. We've invested a lot of money in our infrastructure and our transportation program, and we have money allocated for operation and maintenance. <clears throat> and um, if CVAG can improve tra traffic flow around us, it's better because we're already there. <clears throat> it, uh, one of the things that I read, that I got from the article, is that they are trying to perceive that we are going to be a roadblock. It's a scare tactic that everything that come, when they come in to ranch and rise, leaving or ending, it's going to be a block and we have no control over it. So would somebody want to speak to that, how much control we actually have, which is plenty? One of yeah, the I things- I think that's what we're talking about, yeah. preserving and that, I want not to make giving sure it up. The people realize what they're saying is, it's going to halt because we're not in this whole program when it comes to Ranch Mirage, and that's not true. Drive through the city and you can see for yourself. That's why people are here. Good. One of the uh, things that uh, occurs to me is that with uh, CVAG intending to stop CV Link at Parkview and Highway 111, that uh, if they have control of the signals 
instead of a French Mirage having control of the signals, uh, they can manipulate our signal system to accommodate the CV link. And that seems to me to be uh, preposterous. Uh, it, signals should be controlling traffic and uh, uh, although I suspect there's no evidence that they, no evidence yet, that they would uh, try to use the uh, synchronization program to benefit in some manner uh, their multimodal uh, facility, which is what is the name for CV Link, they call it multimodal. But in the contract, you give them authority to um, uh, control over multimodal. Now there's only one, and that's CV Link. So they have, they've made sure that CV Link is within the boundaries of the contract and the agreement that the city would be agreeing to. Uh, and so they could stop automobile traffic to let uh, bicycles or uh, neighborhood electric vehicles or whatever pedestrians uh, come across. It's just not something that we shouldn't be controlling. We can do the same and we will. And we'll do a whole lot better job. And one of the other issues that uh, is interesting is that if we think something should be changed in the system, this is again in the contract, if we think something should be changed or there's it's not functioning the way we think it ought to. We have to submit the issue to CVAG. CVAG submits it to a committee, and the committee sends it back to the executive committee of CVAG. All of that, when currently, if we have a problem with signalization somewhere, we have it fixed within 24 hours almost every time. We have somebody out, go out, take care of it, click. We don't have a committee that has to evaluate it. It's, a, uh, to me, a, uh, a crazy thing. And I might say, after watching the executive committee of CVAG uh, administer and control to some extent the uh, CV link, all of the issues that we've faced uh, regarding CV link, I don't have a lot of uh, faith that the executive committee which would mean, there, all that means is one person from each of the other cities. That's the executive committee, and they would be uh, controlling our destiny. And there are people on that who I think, well, I, I don't want to say what I think about their capacity, but there are people there, some are better than others, let's put it that way. And uh, for us to uh, surrender our control of managing our signals for our residents on a quick basis uh, is something that I don't think we should be doing, certainly now, we, and we can always change our minds. If CVAG comes up with something that seems really appropriate to us, we always can join the program at that time. Sure, you know what, Councilman, what would you want to send a bill of price from um, Springs Country Club down to CVAG to talk to them about a <laughs> stop sign? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, Bill, is Bill still here? No, he's alive. He's he's not, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we like solving our own issues for our people because it gets done quickly and it gets done right. And that's why Rancho Mirage stands out over every other city in the valley. We are the best managed city in the valley, in my view, and in the view of many others. In my view, too, Dana. I'm with you on that. Anything else, Dana? No. I'm Richard, fine. anybody else have any comment, Ted? I, all right. With that, then we will move on to Iris Motridge. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we have a lot of good things going on all the time. And this is high season, and we're thrilled with some of the programs that we can continue to bring our residents and our visitors and our businesses. and. Uh, we take all of this with great pride. And one of the more thing that we're going to be doing, and maybe Jason, you can put up the, uh, on the screen, the flyer. Uh, the city's Emergency Preparedness Commission is pleased to present the first Emergency Preparedness Town Hall Forum for 2018 on February 21st. The forum will be showing the film Quake Heroes to raise awareness of what can happen in a major earthquake. Hundreds of interviews were conducted with people who experienced the 1994 Northridge earthquake and 
what emerged with several incredible stories filled with courage, suspense, selflessness, danger, and love. These stories have now been woven together into Quake Heroes, a 52-minute documentary film that inspires the viewers to get prepared and to be ready to help their neighbors until firefighters or other professionals, first responders, and others arrive after the large earthquake. <laughs> the forum will begin with a champagne reception at 5.30 p.m., and the program will start at 6 p.m. All this is happening, of course, free of charge at the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory on February 21st, and we encourage our residents to attend this important event, and we encourage everyone in the entire Coachella Valley to attend this wonderful event. Um, it's something that will affect us, all of us, in some way, whether it's fires or floods or uh, chemical spills on our freeways, for our rail system, so we always want people to be as prepared as possible, and this film will really document a lot of concerns and a lot of ways people did react. Also, going on uh, next month will be another town hall forum, and this will be headed by Jim McFarlane, who is also a professional member of our uh, Emergency Preparedness Commission. We have two other professional members who are technical advisors. One is Dr. Dennis Maletti, who really specializes in earthquake preparedness and earthquake activity around the state. And also Dr. David Tang, who is an emergency uh, room uh, doctor at uh, Eisenhower Hospital. So we're very proud that they come and they give their expertise and we can all benefit from it. Uh, the event that uh, Jim McFarlane will be talking about is cyber terrorism, and he wrote a book uh, about such a thing, and everyone kind of, their eyes got like saucers, wondering what is going on with cyber terrorism, and he first presented it several years back to our commission. Uh, no one had ever heard about that, but now we all know firsthand some of this, how bad it can be and how terrorism on the cyber uh, and infiltrating into our computers can really be a disaster for a lot of people. So, like our amphitheater and our library programs, we offer some of the finest entertainment and educational lectures and fun stuff, whether it's for children or teens or adults, it's all free of charge at our amphitheater, at our library, and we take pride knowing that we are not selfish. We share it with everyone. We invite everyone, whether you're visiting or you live here, uh, come and partake of all the things we offer. We also are going to be offering in our park, at our amphitheater uh, later on, movies in the park. We have several that are going to be wonderful, and uh, you won't want to miss them. So put these things on your calendar, look on our website, and uh, make yourself available because you'll have a good time. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Iris. Mr. Councilman Weil. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give you an update uh, on the progress of the, Tel the Del Webb Rancho Mirage project to construct approximately 1,100 new homes. This is the single largest project in our city in well over a decade. It's extremely exciting. The project is located at the northeast corner of Dinah Shore in Los Alamos, directly across from the Westin Hotel. The developer has been moving forward at an incredible pace in order to meet the demand that continues to build from potential home buyers. An estimate of 5,000 people have already signed the interest list. That doesn't mean that everyone will be converted to a buyer, but 5,000 already is a significant number. The following is a series of photos that has been taken in, at the project site depicting the project made in just the last couple of weeks. And <coughs> truly, it changes daily. This is the entry guard house. Uh, will create a sense of arrival for homeowners and guests. It'll be quite spectacular when it's finished. Extremely, extremely <coughs> alluring. This is the 
here are a couple of photos of the new tree plantings that will be seen as one makes their way through the project. If you drive down Dinah Shore and, uh, and proceeding east and look to your left, you will be amazed at the number of trees that have been brought onto the site. It's just remarkable. The, uh, the next slide will be the model sales building. Uh, this is what will be, uh, this is under construction. It's already framed. Uh, and this essentially is where the, uh, the tour will begin. The foundation of the model homes uh, are being poured as we speak. As a matter of fact, the foundations that you're looking at now, they're so far along that the homes uh, have already been framed. This is how quickly things change out there. There will be 10 models. Uh, three distinct elevations, 30, 20 different color material combinations. This is a construction of the photo of the lake. You can see the initial uh, outline. It will be uh, an upper and a lower lake. Again, quite spectacular. The rock and boulder placement occurring within a week of the previous photo has come in and goes around the lake. Within a week of the slide depicting foundations, as I mentioned before, uh, the 10 model homes were framed. Uh, Bud Kopp mentioned to me today that uh, uh, those, uh, those models have now been, uh, uh, have had roofs added, and in a couple of cases, uh, Bud said that uh, the tile is already on the roof. Mm -hmm. This is a view from the window of one of the model homes. A shot of the construction site taken yesterday shows just how much activity is taking place. Portions of the site and the model homes are expected to be available for viewing by the public uh, in May. 14 homes have already been sold. Production units will be, under, uh, will be under construction March 1st. The clubhouse, which will be an amazing uh, edifice, is scheduled to begin in June. And representatives now are having meetings uh, scheduled with 400 interested buyers. They've set up a satellite sales office at the Westin Hotel. That's where the interviews are being taken, taking place. Actually, <coughs> Pulte developer has leased space at the uh, West End until the sales office is fully functional. It's, it's going to be an amazing project. I can tell you this, that the, the retailers in the shopping centers on Dinah Shore are extremely excited about it. And I, I personally believe that part of the motivation uh, of, the, uh, of the expansion of the Agua Caliente Casino by the tribe for their hotel and their commercial activities is as a result of the development of the uh, Pulte project. You're dealing with 1,100 homes, uh, possibly two, per two people to a home, that's 2,200 people. That's a lot of potential sales to those uh, facilities. So it's very exciting. It's a great, great project for the city and great project uh, for, the, uh, for the area. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, everybody, for all that wonderful comments from all of you. Now we will move on to approve the minute meetings. And the clerk informed me that Councilman Weil requested that the February 1st, 2018 regular meeting minutes be revised to include his comments regarding Sergeant Myers and Mr. Ron Hare. Are there any additional corrections to the minutes? All right, seeing none, I will make a motion to approve the October 12th, 2017 special meetings, January 12th, 2018 special meeting, and February 1st, 2018, regular meeting minutes, including the stated revisions. Is there a second? Second. 
Do we know that everybody was at those meetings? Everybody was at that meeting? Yes, yes. Second was Iris. You please vote. Motion passes 5-0. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Next is a consent calendar. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Randy Binder, our city manager. Randy, will you please introduce the consent items? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Good afternoon. Um, just one correction, because I was unable to be at the um, study session, the RMEA study session. Right. So I will abstain from that. So she's changing her vote to abstain. All right, on Chris. Minutes, abstain on right. the minutes for 2018. Right. So, no so noted. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Iris. Randy? Right. You know, I hadn't read the article uh, this morning, but when I saw the quotes that uh, you were talking about, <coughs> You know, the city is not the kind of city where we're out there tuning our own horn, but when you get criticized for unfounded accusations like um, not, not uh, taking care of our traffic flow or not uh, spending um, taxpayer money wisely or appropriately, it's um, something that we need to defend ourselves. So, Thank you, Randy. It seems like we're the important. rogue nation. We don't need to be out in front of things and tooting our own horn, but we do need to defend ourselves for the good work I think we do for the citizens of the city. At any rate, let's go ahead and move on to the uh, consent calendar. We only have a couple of items, Mr. Mayor, on your consent calendar. The first of which is a uh, uh, Bill Enos, our city engineer, is uh, put on the um, phase two of the track map 36809 which is not a sexy name, but <laughs> Del Webb Rancher Mirage is. And so here's a, an exhibit you can take a look at. This is the project that Councilman Weil was talking about earlier, and thank you, Bud Kopp, our planning manager, for handling this project basically single-handedly from the time the tribe first started processing it and MSA designed it to the time uh, Bud probably assigned the street names. So, and to today when he probably went out this morning and got his uh, shoes dirty again. <laughs> and maybe a truck stuck in the sand. <laughs> <clears throat> At any rate, the, uh, what I put in blue here, I'm not as high tech as some of the other employees, but you can see what I highlighted in blue is phase one, which is the first phase of the track map, and I think it's about 160 lots there. What's on today's agenda, Mr. Mayor, is final map for phase two, which is highlighted in green. Um, this tells me that this project is moving along from a popularity standpoint with the developer pretty well because normally you wouldn't get a second phase so quick in the process. Uh, further to the north at future council meetings you'll, you'll see uh, new phases come in with their final maps. Total of uh, 1,029 units on 320 acres I think is what this project is for a density of 3.2 units an acre. Item number two, uh, Mr. Mayor, on your consent calendar is a request for um, awarding special assistance funds. This is money that the city set it, sets aside for grant funding for programs that provide food and shelter uh, and clothing to um, underserved populations, uh, as well as uh, many other things that the um, subcommittee uh, deems appropriate, which is Councilman Weil and Councilwoman Smotridge. Um, the recommendation here is to fund $1,000 to Cancer Partners, which is what we all used to call Gilda's Club, right. Desert Cities, and uh, $5,000 to the Pegasus Therapeutic Riding Academy for all ages, and serves people of, with special need, individuals, and, and they get to ride horses. And that, that ranch actually used to be on the west side of Monterey Avenue, south of the, uh, north of the, uh, SCE substation south of Verbania Road before they moved out to Thousand Palms, but that's in the past. Anyhow, $5,000 is a uh, good recommendation on that, and if you approve both of those today, the total to date would be 24 charities that the city will have funded to the tune of $84,000. Very good. Item number three on your consent calendar is approval of a contract. It's a contract re request by our IT manager 
uh, Jason Hattigay. He is asking for an extra $25,000 for something called HR Payroll Data Conversion Project. Uh, we're in the middle of updating the entire technology system for the city of Rancho Mirage to allow us to be even more responsive and efficient uh, for the city council and the um, city as a whole, bringing us into the future, Tomorrowland, with an e-ticket, of course, the way we <laughs> normally do things. And um, as Jason sold this project to me, poor data conversion is the leading cause of death among technology implementation programs. So goodness knows we don't need want our ERP project to die. <laughs> Jason, <laughs> he's always on top of everything. Forerunner, forerunner, yes, very that's, good. That's for sure. Uh, item number four are your demands, which are the checks that the city cuts to keep the economy of the Coachella Valley humming along. Very good, Randy. Are there any comments from the public? or the council on any of the consent items. All right, seeing none in the audience, anybody in the council? I'm seeing none. Then I will make a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. Is there a second, please? So moved. Please vote. Motion passes, 5-0. Thank you, Chris. We will now move to the action calendar. Item number five is a resolution regarding automated license plate reading systems. Isaiah Hagerman, our Director of Administrative Services, will present the staff report. Isaiah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, the Sheriff's Department is uh, requesting uh, the use of automated license plate reader systems within the City of Rancho Mirage. The automated license plate reader system uh, is a camera that is mounted on patrol vehicles and it takes pictures of vehicles license plates which are then translated into letters and numbers. <clears throat> the resulting data is compared to law enforcement databases to see if the vehicle has been reported stolen, wanted for being used in a crime, or is displaying lost or stolen license plates. If the license plate number is found to be wanted, the system will alert the deputy driving so they can investigate further. The automated license plate reader data is only accessible by law enforcement personnel for official investigation purposes, and all access is logged by users. To give you an example of the effectiveness of these systems, uh, within the cities uh, which contract with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department for Law Enforcement Services, there were approximately 5,000 vehicle thefts with approximately 4,200 recoveries. The automated license plate reader system was instrumental in several of those recoveries, which led to the arrest and prosecution of criminals and the quick recovery of the victim's property and vehicle. The state of California passed uh, Senate Bill 34, which requires a community to uh, open uh, this item up to the public for an opportunity to comment. So that's what we will uh, accomplish today. Uh, after which the council will consider the resolution that is attached to the staff report. Uh, and simply put, uh, this program and this software and this equipment uh, helps our police department do their jobs. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Isaiah. Any comments from council? Any questions? Question. Isaiah, uh, is there any financial impact on the city with this, uh, I, this ordinance? Yeah, so... Uh, the equipment does carry, obviously, software, license, some of the equipment has to be replaced, but it's built into the uh, equipment uh, charge that we get from the sheriff now. So, yes, we do pay for it, but it's built in within our rates. Any other comments? Yeah, what, what does our uh, sheriff's department uh, say about this? Uh, they are in favor of it, and they are recommending it uh, uh, to the council. The reader is only used for that one, prop, uh, that one purpose. I say it's not used for traffic control or tickets or anything else. No, so it's not a rolling video. It takes photographs. And then that data is converted into letters and numbers that goes in basically a license plate number 
and then that is transmitted to the database and it will alert the deputy driving that they just got a hit on that license plate number and for whatever reason, the deputy at that point will investigate further and they have to log that in with dispatch. So they have to report to dispatch that they are following up on a hit uh, from this program. Um, and uh, from what they've seen, it's a very useful program in recovering uh, stolen property, identifying stolen vehicles, because uh, for a deputy to recognize every license plate that has been reported stolen is very impractical. This uh, technology alerts the deputy when it comes across one of those numbers. Very good. Captain Husky, you want to say a few words on this? Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, council members. I just want to reiterate what Mr. Hagerman uh, has just said and uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, we do support this program. It's actually been in existence for over eight years. Um, we've used it throughout the county for a variety of purposes, although it was initially uh, considered just to be a tool to find uh, stolen vehicles and it's definitely very good at that. We've discovered that it has several law enforcement uses, including finding missing people. Uh, sometimes we have silver alerts of uh, people that might, might be lost. They might be in their vehicle, have Alzheimer's disease, or even lost children. There's a lot of different law enforcement uses that we use it for, not just criminal investigations. Very good. Any additional comments? Uh, just one more thing that I wanted to add to uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Kite's question. Uh, we, we did speak with uh, the Sheriff's Department, and uh, currently there is one vehicle uh, that is outfitted with this technology. We're currently working with them to, if this is approved by the Council today, we would work with them to add additional vehicles into our fleet with this technology on it. The, uh, the public meeting that is needed to pass this We'll discuss what specific topics. No, the, the, we're accomplishing that today. So when we open it up for public comment, uh, that is the public's opportunity that satisfies uh, SB 34. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank all you. right. And moving to that, are there any public comments? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to make one one uh, thing uh, that's noteworthy. Uh, comment about it because on page five dash two, the annual audits to the system to ensure privacy and security are conducted by the Sheriff's Department Technical Services Bureau. So that will be an annual yes. um, uh, procedure just to make sure people are fe feeling comfortable with the security aspect of this. That's correct. We, we publish our policy on our website available for anybody to see that, but that audit is conducted. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> All right, seeing that, I will call for a motion. All right, Mr. Mayor, I'll be happy to do that. <clears throat> thank you, Ted. Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that the City Council receive public comment regarding implementation of uh, automated license plate reader system and adopt the attached resolution authorizing the Riverside County Sheriff's Department to implement the use of the automated license plate reader system within the jurisdictional boundaries of the city and direct staff to prepare and approve any necessary amendments to the current Sheriff's Department contract. I would second that. We have a second. Please vote. <clears throat> Motion passes 5-0. Very good. And I just reiterate, I did open it up twice to public comments. There were none. Okay. Moving on. We are now going to go to closed session. Mr. Quintanilla, will you please introduce the closed session item? Uh, Mr. Mayor, before I announce the closed session items, I'd like to just make a comment as a follow-up to the city manager's comment about the city not tooting their horn. Yes. Um, over all the good that the city does. Um, I was disturbed um, personally by this statement that the um, city has slashed funding for CVAG's homelessness, homelessness program. Um, what, the, what is not known commonly amongst this, um, other valley cities because the city does not toot its horn is that this city provides a, a lot of financial assistance through their special assistance funds program. They provide financial assistance with children with special needs. They, find, they provide um, financial assistance with people with AIDS, financial assistance to the Children's Discovery Museum um, for cancer patients, and for food programs for needy families. So I would hope that 
any time the city is criticized for its funding of any sort of program for people in need, that they also identify all of the other programs that the city provides financial assistance for. Very good, and Steve, oh, also but, let me just say also that they have, this city has contributed over $1 million, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in the last 10 years to Roy's, and we also contribute to the POL, which is the path of life, that they said that we did not contribute to that, we did. And speaking of the uh, Roy's, Rancho Mirage is one of, is just one of the three cities that met, met its commitment under that CVAG agreement to fund Roy's. Yes. So there were only three cities that did that, and Rancho Mirage was one of them. In any event, I'll get back to my real job here. So the City Council is now going to recess into closed session to confer with legal counsel regarding three potential litigation items. That's pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D4. The Council will also confer with legal counsel regarding the existing case known as Veronica Juarez versus City of Rancho Mirage. And that's also pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9D1. Very good, and with that, I will close this session into closed session. Thank you for all in the audience. Thank you all at home for watching. We are now adjourned to closed session. <laughs>